Good evening and welcome to the new Athens. You need to emerge from this COVID-1984 pandemic. New Athens, the blockchain think tank, brings you those tools to understand the chaos swirling around us and the forum to debate how a new generation will take control from the govidiots currently mismanaging our nation and our world with a breakaway civilization leaving us behind. Watch our Friday Night Lights live stream from the bunker on the New Athens YouTube channel for the best that is thought and said on the issues of the day. Ask not what the New Athens can do for you. Ask what you can do for the New Athens. If you like it, leave a like. If you like the content, please subscribe and share. I'm Lorenzo Mefsud, founder of the New Athens. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time. Good evening, and welcome to the New Athens, live here from the bunker uh, on 10 p.m. just after London time on this, the Friday the 26th of June 2020. Uh, our hashtag for tonight is uh, hashtag uh, smart, uh, startup civilization, and... We're here today uh, to discuss with you how we take control, a new generation producing a pro-human future using blockchain technology to empower ourselves with education, to empower ourselves with new startups, new entrepreneurship, and to create a knowledge standard uh, cryptocurrency moving out of the Bitcoin reality of the digital gold standard towards the digital uh, uh, knowledge standard, so the exchange of knowledge and 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 the exchange of skill, and then the building of, of new entrepreneurship around the world through our series of of seeded smart city states inside existing cities. So we'll be setting that up soon with a new New Athens Constitution and with a, with a new Citizens Bill of Rights uh, that we can all sign up to and protect our our bodily sovereignty and our the sovereignty of our intellectual property and many other rights that we're not being guaranteed right now, including free speech, which is why, of course, we fly the Republican flag here at the New Athens. Um, the key here is that uh, America is kind of a sandbox for the Republic. I think Alex Jones said it best the other day that a, a democracy guarantees the rights of the majority and a republic guarantees the rights of uh, the individual. So on that note, we have an individual here with us tonight, somebody who has been uh, a, 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 a buccaneer, a privateer, uh, a, a, a swordsman of, all, of, of, of freedom and of uh, the human intellect and potential and uh, taking the energy of humanity and giving it new structures. Martin Skinner joins us this evening. Welcome, Martin. Thank you very much, mate. Very kind of you to have me. No, it's such a pleasure, such a pleasure. Um, and we've been, we were discussing till late last night, late this morning, actually, some of the implications of Martin's understanding of uh, human potential and energy and the way to like uh, structure and refine and uh, control for not only not only the energy of institutions but also the energy of chaos, the energy of originality, that quantum of. Uh, of human understanding, which we which we kind of suppress in society, and actually we should be building in society because creative people are those who break rules; they're not those who follow rules, and they're those who they're those who who, who allow people to take new paths. And so I think that's something that that, that, that you're really really interested in right now, uh, and a conversation that we've been having. So yeah, what's 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 uh, what's been on your mind in the last in the last eighteen hours or so? Well, I thought we were coming to have a, a little offline chat, frankly. So. Uh, being on TV isn't quite what I had planned. Oh well, I mean, what this is this Let's is a, a go. this Let's is a free it. speech show. We're First <laughs> Amendment, we're First Amendment pure. We're we're First Amendment guaranteed here. It's a free, it's a full free fire zone, and uh, uh, we are you know we we we're very keen to have somebody quite so quite so enterprising. Martin is a property developer. He's uh, 
uh, event uh, manager. He's got new startups that he's building. And I thought we'd summon up uh, a little potted bio just to, <laughs> just to begin with, which I thought was quite exciting. Uh, if you share the screen, Ollie. Uh, so here we have uh, the Times, Thursday, December 26th. Last year, 2019, uh, released Martin... online on Christmas Day. Oh, fantastic! My mom was so proud. Yes, Martin on a yacht, uh, in a little circle here. We can uh, probably zoom in. Maybe. Oh, there we go. We can zoom in. Uh, here's Martin on a yacht with some um, amusing uh, companions. And uh, where was the yacht? What were you up to? Uh, that was my friend James's yacht. I yes, won't, I won't say more than that because right. uh, you've seen the conversation I had with him. He wasn't overly impressed. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. Oh, okay. That now fits. Together. I was quite pleased. You know. um, I mean, of all the pictures they could have taken off my Instagram, I know it's probably the best. It's a it's a nice sort of baller baller move, right? <laughs> um, so so Martin is in the middle of a whole load of really fascinating projects. Uh, one of which we were we were discussing last night um, about. Uh, now, where can I find that? We can actually summon it up and we can get because you said you had some difference. That, yeah, it was it was what part of your thinking, but not all of your thinking was in this doc. Well, I'm still figuring it out. So as, uh, as most people are, I think, with their yeah. lives. I mean, this is a, um, we're in a think tank now. So like yeah. let's 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 do some let's do some thinking. I mean, I was really interested in this. Um and it, because it was an idea I'd had some years ago, uh, meeting. I think that the vodka is yeah, there we go. Yeah, so we all sponsored. We got various sponsors, non-sponsorship <laughs> sponsorships. I'm not sure they'd be willing to be shown on the channel, but we'll see. We'll see when we when 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 they get in touch. Uh, <laughs> Shout out Sponsors to Budweiser. Always welcome, by the yeah. way. Yes, yes, a, yes uh, exactly. I think I think we're going to get we're going to yeah. get a medafinil sponsor. I'm going to try and get a medafinil sponsor on the show um, as as we're growing because I think you know we 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 don't want to we don't want an unlively audience and we want to get people to really use the maximum of their brain potential. And you know, it's something that, that we're well, the very pure, the purest possible cocaine sponsor would be. Ah, fabulous. well, yeah. I mean, um, is that is that very cognitive? Does that do you find it's cognitive, fully cognitive? Uh, but it helps me to stay awake when I get calls at ridiculous o'clock and mm. have to just keep working. Okay. Whatever okay. time it is. Yeah. Um, so if you share the screen and we can maybe do a picture in picture. There we go. So here we are. Um, so this is Madness, um, a great awakening campaign and street festival on World Mental Health Day 2020, promoting and supporting a total rethink and reboot in the way mental health issues are perceived and approached by society and the potential transformational social benefits of replacing a stiff, outdated social control model with a reflexive modern social investment model at a pivotal time as the coronavirus pandemic causes an unprecedented spike in cases. So you two attended me last night, 95% uh, saturation in the population in Britain was achieved. I have it on uh, very good authority. Yeah, from a genius friend of mine who um, runs one of the best hotel hosp hospitals. Sorry, not hotels, hospitals yes. in London. Um, he's very much a civil servant, so I won't disclose exactly who he is. We, but, we um, keep our sources to ourselves, but we discuss I'm, the terms as soon as he's happy to. I will. Yeah, um, fantastic. But he, he, I was expecting a second wave. Yes, and we were in the middle of a. Uh, very entertaining evening together, um, and we had a brief discussion about this. And he he, he was able to convince me very quickly. Actually, mm. um, I do try to keep an open mind, mm. even though I'm generally relatively sure that I'm right about most things. I'm in reality roast wrong about most things. Um, Socrates I, I said, the, uh, the only thing I that. know that it is that I know nothing. <laughs> yeah. um, and so no. And what he also he was also against writing. He said that only that writing was like leaving a Spartan leaving his baby out on a hillside to see if it survived because you're not there to answer the questions that come to your ideas. And so I think what, what we've been doing um, over the past few weeks and, and, and today, uh, certainly here and with and between us, was you, know, you really proving things through through the testing of conversation. And I think that's really important. Well, that moves on to the human quantum yes. processing, doesn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, Original ideas and how they're formed. Okay. And the space that people need to create those ideas outside of the mainstream, outside of this, this kind of institutional structures we have. That's something we're trying to, we're trying to like, awaken people to here. And it's something I know that you're really, you're really uh, inside that honeycomb. Um, so yeah, this, this is madness is intriguing. So taking, taking insanity and kind of, Kind of re reappropriating it and saying, well, what is the what is the creative side 
Or think. is there a logic to it in the first place? Is it really insane? Yes. I mean, I, so I was I was uh, speaking to M, who wrote uh, Diaries of a Sociopath. Uh, and I know you would talk about the John Ronson book about about this this phenomenon. And you know what, what we were we were looking at was how sociopathy is kind of it's kind of like a very evolutionarily fit trait in war zones and cities so the anonymity of the city and as you as you were discussing the kind of the the focus uh, the in the moment focus of the war zone are two areas where actually um the 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 singular focus of people with with sort of what well, I think we're now terming um, neurodiversity um, uh, in in the sort of in the sort of mainstream uh, psychological uh, 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 literature, they call it like neurodiversity. They say, okay, these aren't disorders; they're um, the different ways that brains are programmed, and so they can be extremely uh, fertile in producing like, original content. Um, so I know you were thinking about how to kind of create an accelerator for that. I would just allow it to happen. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an addict. I'm more than happy to uh, admit that, and I'm proud of it. Mm. I think that is typically a stigmatized um, judgment mm. of an OCD, mm. ADHD person. Mm. Um, so someone that specializes, specialization in division of labor is typically the more efficient way to get things done. Yes. Purposeful practice takes over from the hygiene factor um, yes, you're benchmark. Talking about, you're talking about the, hygiene the, the, factor. Practice yeah. is a hygiene factor, you were saying. The myth of talent and the purpose, the, 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 the power of practice. The Matthew okay. Syed book is, is fascinating and it, and it kind of illustrates how the body and the brain redesign themselves around the things that you actually do. Yeah. As long as you're not just cruising through, you're purposefully practicing. Those 10,000 hours. Yeah. Um, it goes a bit beyond that. With, though. Um, that's, that's the, um, uh, Mal Malcolm Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell, brilliant books. Yeah. Um, no. And then and we, Ma and Matthew Syed's kind of takes that to the next level. Okay. So what, what's, what's his, what's his, uh, what's his stick? So he's saying that you take your 10,000 hours, which is this as long as you've been consciously purposefully practicing oh this it. is this you're notion just cruising of, through and yes. subconsciously unconscious uncompetence mode. there was there was that little matrix of unconscious incompetence when you're I really like done that. and then uh conscious incompetence when you know that you're doing it wrong but you're trying to improve then conscious competence of like you're, you're there you're kind of working it out but you can you know that you're in the process of of being proficient and then unconscious competence is where you're, it's natural. You've taken it, you've taken the thing on and it's, 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 it's then, it's then moving through you in a flow state and, and you're kind of there. Now maximizing marginal gains. Yes. So it's, it's kind of the Formula One driver that is just incrementally improving. Getting that apex. His pace through that the apex. each and every yeah. corner. Yeah. Marginal gains. Maximizing marginal gains. Maximizing yeah. marginal gains. So, yeah, I mean, we, ca I, I remembered from our conversation last night um one of those little moments where that happened and was it and the bit we, where i knocked the drink all over a deal <laughs> <laughs> to illustrate frustration his, his, his interruption his, his, yes, illustrating his, the adhd component that's typically <laughs> paired with OCD, yeah no um in my opinion so ocd adhd as a as a as a back-to-back a -back two sides of the same coin pair mm. so there's the obsession with with cleanliness and there's the obsession with the, as you say, the hygiene ritual of things like practicing and, and focusing. Um, well, no, I, I would say the hygiene factor is the talent component. The hygiene as in, if you don't have enough physical body parts yes. to be able to do a particular activity, mm. then it's going to be difficult for you to really excel at it. Mm. However, if you do and you then purposefully practice whatever it is that you're doing, then you have the opportunity with enough practice to, to become an expert. Yes, to level um, up in that way. But it goes well beyond the, the, the 10,000 hours, I think. Um, and that's where I personally believe we're, we're, we're kind of breeding OCDs um, okay. at the top end of the social spectrum yeah. and at the bottom end. I've had the privilege of being in jail with some absolutely amazing people mm -hmm. who I would say are effectively the same. 
as the people that happen to be at the top end of the social spectrum. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I haven't mean... I haven't had the chance to talk to economists about this sort of thing mm. um, and get certain good research support for it. But I, I have a gut feel that, based on my experience, that is what's happening. Yeah, the top end of the social so breeding, spectrum, you have breeding the people OCD. that are really successful. Yeah, typically specialization and division of labor. Yeah, I OCD to quite an extreme degree, plus a lot of persistence. Mm. Um, and that's that tends to be given a little bit of a bit of luck as well. Um, how people really succeed to, a, to an extreme degree. And there's degree. a scattershot element of this where to 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 attempt to succeed is to risk absolute failure of course yeah. and and, and what's and that, you know, that success. ruthlessness with yourself it's like this idea that you you've got to push yourself to the nth degree that you know is is possible as we were looking at the quantum that sort of quantum energy that you were talking about in in in, in having to be in the moment and then you and then you ride that ride the way ride down in the wormhole and then you get, well i think you know um, what, what what do they say about newspaper articles um the the negative ones mm. attract twice as much interest as the positive ones um so for me that means that if you get something wrong and you fuck it up and it could be humiliating whatever it is you you you, you as long as you're willing to swallow your pride and yeah. deal with your ego and actually learn from what's happened mm. you have the opportunity to learn at least twice as fast yes from things going wrong so if you can psychologically reframe that you know, most people are, who are OCD, in my experience, tend to be extra emotionally sensitive. About their um, own failing, about their yeah, own I mean, potential they care. for failing. They care. Yeah. And typically that starts with themselves, um, for whatever reason. Um, mm. If you can manage that, I go through a process of psychologically reframing things. Okay. So rather than just getting so hurt by it, I try and... Explain okay. to myself, for example, actually, I've learned twice as fast as long okay. as I genuinely. So it's not, a, it's not a humiliation. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have humiliation some of these, is okay if I it means that you're going to be less hurt by it next time. I have some of these traits. Like, I prefer to show nothing in public rather than show something that I'm unsatisfied with. And I put, my, I've structured my life to a certain extent so that I can only show off the thing the products that i really am proud of and and then i keep you know keep it in keep it in draft you know keep everything in draft until you're ready for the exposure of well, that's the, the failure in your the perfectionist ex ex exposure in your own eyes of oh I, this isn't exactly what i wanted so i'm i'm good and you have then you have then people don't like someone that is too successful in my opinion in my experience they start to get jealous they might start to compete they might start to undermine oh, yeah. you i i actually prefer to show the worst side of myself oh really often. yeah okay um, so that is that did you learn to do that as a as a as a as a self-talk as a as a as a means of as you say controlling for for your unwillingness to fail so you that's, just quite, no, no, that's quite an interesting point um my my vision tends to narrow time slows down a little bit and i'm good at being logical and analyzing the different potential outcomes in a situation if it starts to get intense yeah. Um, so I used to get punched quite a lot in nightclubs and things because generally I was the tallest, but I'm quite scrawny. I'm you know, slightly ginger, tennis playing, white kid. Um, but I have got quite a, quite a well established sense of uh, uh, right and wrong and moral yes. conduct. So if someone just starts getting aggressive with my friends or, or with me, I'd, I'd kind of be like, <laughs> I don't really understand. <laughs> um, why, why are you accusing me or him of, of being a cunt when I can only really determine from this situation that it, you know, you're being a bit of a dick, aren't you? Bang. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't work out very well. Okay. So, so you I learned switched it around that. over okay. time. Over time, I, I, I just thought, do you know what? I've got better things to do. You're absolutely right. I'm a total cunt. So I'm just going to go off there, have a great night. Yeah, I, I find but that... then there was a third stage, yeah, which is that's fine. But if you just swallow that and soak it all up all the time, actually, other people might see you as a, you know, e e easy, easy meat. Yeah, um, and I don't mind that. 
but if you have stakeholders that are dependent upon you, mm. you're responsible for them. Well, there is a there's a game theory. There's a game theory them, called yeah. the punishment game. Okay. Um, and if you just allow someone to take advantage of you all the time, they're not just going to take advantage of you that time. On average, they're going to do it more do, and more and more yeah. and more, which affects and take, your stakeholders. And take more, yeah, and take yeah. more. So you do have a responsibility, I think, to, shut to punish it off. occasionally yes. when that fits into the right box. No, I've I've found a very similar like social dynamic that, um, as you say, be, like being a, a cunt to begin with is why like is wise in a way is at least you're setting out the terms. But it's a, it's about contract theory oh again. About, about a friend of mine called Terms died last year. Oh. That was his name because he'd always set the terms. Ah. Of the so, yeah, contract. We've been really focusing on contract law here because one of the notions we have with the Great Body Snatch 2020 that we, we've been covering and where the government took all, all our organs who of us who weren't organ donors on the 19th of May this year, quite secretly, Theresa May passed a law saying uh, all non-organ donors are now opt out and then it passed after her term. It passed just uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think that's quite good. So for now, but they've they've ring fenced the asset value of all of the organs of sixty five million people who weren't already organ donors, and they've they've said, okay, well now you're leasing your body from the government. And now you need to return <laughs> it to them in the quality when you when you when the when the contract finishes and and in the in in the quality in the state that that you that you that you found it. And so it's our responsibility now to completely ruin our bodies so that the government doesn't want them, uh, and we don't get organ harvested. Well, really, I, I, I'm, um, I'm an efficiency guy. I would much rather that. Things weren't wasted. I understand what you're saying, but in the end, if you're in a persistent vegetative state in a Soviet in a Soviet health system like in Britain, you don't get to say, "Oh my, you're you're it's you're." Creating a Soviet health system. No, 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 no. Today, I mean, it's pretty good, but uh, people you go there, <laughs> you, you go there, people go, Philip goes there, people go there. Um, just yours probably dentistry. is in a much better state than um, mine. So, so. Um, for the, uh, for the right price, all my so, so, the, okay, so, so when mind. you're when you're in a <laughs> when you're in a so, when you're in a Soviet healthcare system with rationing as we have here, like in a, we get this idea about America that in America, oh, you get these Christians who say, uh, you know, oh, my son has had a car crash, he's in a persistent vegetative state, and we're, this insurance company is going to keep paying the bills, and he's not, he, we're going to keep him on the on the ventilator forever. That's not the case here. We've actually had uh, evidence come in of this COVID crisis that our very close friend, Philip Fiersov's uh, father, was taken off a machine because he was said not to be a candidate for the treatment. And he was, he was, he in Watford, Watford General. We, we have, we have uh, a lot of evidence. Seeing if you can help this idiot to find his way out. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> Dan, Dan's very, very good. Um, oh, hello. Uh, Christab uh, Christabel's calling in. You met Christabel last week. Oh. Christabel, hey. Very well. Okay. Martin's here. All Hi, Christabel. Here. How are you? We're do that again? Martin Skinner's here. Oliver's here. How are you doing? I'm, I'm really good, thanks. I'm just looking for somewhere to get drunk. Okay, well, come over to the studio. We're having a little live stream, and you're live on it now. You're not doing it now, are you? Yeah, yeah. you're live on it now. And there's uh, there's there's some, I don't know what that says, but it's vodka. <laughs> and Medassa. Sat right here. Um, yeah, so come by. We'll see you in a bit. Okay, we're in the middle of a discussion about psychology. <laughs> we want to hear about the Tavistock. Catch in sight. You know where it is. Um, so, uh, it's a two raving plus. Um, uh, this is a secret underground bunker. This is the bunker. You shouldn't yes. be giving out the address. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Silly me. Anyway, Reese's Parkies, people. Um, Reese's Parkies. Uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. So, um, where were we? Uh, yeah, so, so being a cunt, uh, uh, the first grasp, like, it's good to be I think sharp. it's okay to be a cunt, it's, yes, as long as you're a good cunt. Exactly, as long as you morally... That's what I was known as, 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 as a burning man. As long as you have, a, you know, a moral framework and, and a set of moral principles which you stand by, and you know that, although you don't apologise for yourself, because there's no point in apologising for other people's feelings, that you have a code, and you know when it is that you've broken your own you, you You've broken your as own As long code. as you're clear up front... Exactly. I think you're so, so, oh yes, to, 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 so, so, but you should always, in so my the opinion, so remain open-minded. So we've got this thing called the social contract, which is not not a real contract because we never sign we never sign the document, right? And so our notion with our new New Athens Constitution, this idea of the, the smart city, this idea of the blockchain republic, is that we should have a consensual social contract where we sign up to the terms and conditions. And like every other contract, which is meant to be a 
contracts are meant to be a reason why my kid my kids don't kill your kids for seven generations right so we we worked out the terms and we can come to an agreement and if either of us break the terms then we can wave the, the piece of paper at one another help with the rather than shooting Where, whereas with a social contract there's no there's no terms and conditions there's no agreement it's just like you're accidentally born somewhere, okay? Or maybe you emigrate somewhere, and then there's a more formal social contract, like you know you have citizenship ceremonies, and you've got to swear fealty to monarchs. We don't; we're free men on the land if we're born in this country. Um, so, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Ed says the idea that serotonin and dopamine are behind it has been debunked. Uh, they were happy in their bunk bed with the serotonin on top. But someone came and upset the bunk. They were bed buddies. Okay. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Ed Mitz is a, an artist and a master gilder and lyric tenor who often comes on the show, very good friend of the show, does a lot of my mm. portraits. He's a wonderful portrait artist. If you need a portrait, Ed, you're mad. Um, well, I've always got plans that I need. Oh, fantastic. Blocks, I need to do yes, yeah. yes we've, got, so we've got a whole stable of artists. Philip's probably fantastic. coming in a minute. I used to have um, stakes in a couple of street art. Guys. Yes, oh, fantastic. Um, so yeah, we've, we've been doing, we've been doing uh, art shows around London and we've got this art accelerator oh, here. Sorry? Lee Bofkin. Vaguely rings a bell. Well, I did the um, well. Actually, my, my my partner in Croydon did the um, my partner in crime. Uh, my partner in crime. <laughs> my partner in Croydon. In this case, definitely. Um, uh, he did the. Who was the guy with the factory in the US? Oh, Warhol. Warhol. So he got seventeen external Warhols that are in existence. And it took three years from the Warhol Foundation and sourcing them all and everything. And he did an art tour all around Croydon with the externals up. Oh, wow. I, I got Ben Ein, thanks to my amazing friend, Vistalia Chilton, to um, do an 11 story mural on the side of Green Dragon House, Fantastic. which I think is the best external piece of art in Croydon by Ray Hill now. It says mesmerizing uh, on it. Is it still there? Uh, yeah, it's still there. Uh, yeah. Green Dragon Dot House. Masters did a couple of pieces on the Tech Hub accelerator there called oh, okay. tmrw tomorrow uh which is amazing um francois mazudier croydon. yeah I, I, I came up with the concept of um shoreditch in croydon oh here um, we are yeah is there a uh, pub called the police station now so is there a pub called in croydon called the um oh it's doesn't matter well i've been banned from the uh the weather springs in there it's the only oh. i think it's the only place i've ever been banned from Oh. Apart oh, from go. driving in the UK and France. Oh, yeah, you can tell they, they know how to run, run an establishment. <laughs> it's unintentional. Go, so I was riding a scooter screen. around and they asked me not to. And I, you share I the forgot. Screen, screen we can see. I, the, I enjoyed that scooter. Go. So this is the mm. mural. That's the Benign, yeah. I said he could write whatever he likes. <laughs> What's the same mess? Yeah. Mesmerizing. Oh, hmm. Ah, rising and it's We've falling. got Dark That's Masters. Nice. We've got... Um, well, there's more some people to put street art up on the buildings. You know, because you can have a relatively ugly um, mm. landscape. landscape and actually make it a little bit more joyous. Put a street art less, in, bring the creatives ugly. in. So and then add the tech component to accelerate the trend growth mm. rate. Yeah, um, we talk about social media and power and, and so on. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, being charming, um uh organ organs, uh civil rights, uh no social contract, but setting out the terms is important. So part of setting out the terms is kind of the invitation to treat in, in, in social life, I find, is not sugarcoating yourself in advance to then betray that. Like you, It's always more functional when you meet somebody to be exactly yourself rather than to be a more charming version of yourself mm -hmm. or especially a more toned down or sweet or polite version of yourself. I mean, you can have grace and you can have charm, but you, you, to edit that, beforehand um in order to in order to 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 to, to get it to, to to get it inside you know somebody's circle or to get inside somebody's reality is then only undermines yourself because you're going to forget how to do it because you're going to relax and then you and then you're not going to be that person you're going to be the actual person and so it's always better yourself to up even more if you're yes. an extra sensitive person yes i yeah. like this idea of being extra sensitive actually because i've always i've not ever seen it in that way but thinking about what you said about perfectionism and about this, the 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 negative self talk and so on about not wanting to be exposed and then reverse engineering that through get it out of the way get it out of the way yeah, yeah. I quite like that um, swallowing your pride um, yeah so oh yeah whether you're whether you're exploitable or not yes that's... I don't mind being exploited mm. I don't mind being used I'm a I, I like to be useful mm. um, within reason 
because I also feel like I have a responsibility to, if I have an opportunity to do good, um, which I think I do. I've had extraordinary experiences and the benefit of quite a lot of time with a lot of extraordinarily amazing people. Um, then I have a responsibility to make most of that yes. as well. Yes. Um, however, I also feel that I have the right and it enables me to deliver more overall as well. Yes. To occasionally be really selfish. Yes. Um, and that little bit of fun, just for the sake of it, allows me to um, so you charge you, my batteries. So you give yourself and, that. You give yourself that breather so you can then be more productive. I want to do both. Yeah. I want to leave the and biggest karmic net balance sheet, yeah. which means accepting failure and allowing mm. for it, celebrating it maybe. Celebrating failure. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Success is about going from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. I don't remember mm. exactly who said that, but um, it was written on the wall in the bell that I was in. <laughs> <laughs> One of the two. Yeah, so um, we, 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 I... From what you were saying last night, I thought of of um, Murray and his book uh, is like really banned now. It's like a really, a really, a really banned book, uh, The Bell Curve, uh, which looked at um, uh, normal distributions, bell curves of different human uh, traits. And so when he looked at intelligence, everyone went very wild about you can't talk about intelligence, you can't talk about IQ as a bell curve and so on, because it, it says that some people are stupid and some people are clever. Uh, most of course, people, people, are, stupid most, and most people are morons in my experience. And but the most people are stupid and clever in different ways. But there are extraordinary opportunities in there. Yes. And so um, in there. but what was one one derivation from all the all those studies, which is very interesting, uh, and, and we, we were discussing briefly last night, was that um, men tend to be quite men tend to be scattershot. And women tend to cluster around the mean when it comes to various kinds of parameters of, 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 of human life. That was your. So um, the idea being that if you look at the genes, it's it's really off, right? You shouldn't have 50-50 male, female in a it, looking at looking at natural selection, um, uh, one woman, one fertile woman can have one kid a year in your kind of animal reality. And whereas one man can have a thousand kids a year with quite a few rest days if he does three a day. Um, <laughs> and so uh, we, so th then you end up looking at, looking at this, at I this like mismatch. I like on efficiency here. You, look, uh, yes, you end up looking at this mismatch between, well, why do we have 50-50 sex ratios in, in, at birth and then throughout the human population? And okay, there are a few fewer men because they die younger and because they do more dangerous stuff and, and, and they try and shoot the moon, as we were saying. They try and shoot the moon and they fail. Um, but you see in you see in human brains that you know there are more male geniuses and more male savants and more male morons. You know, so you get this wide you get this wide big tail as we were discussing last night. The, that, long that, tail. That, yeah. Yeah, long that long tail that um, Taleb term um, of you know m masculine genius and extreme failure. And often the genius has other has other attributes like gay and so on, which then of course that takes you away from reproduction in a different direction. And so you then have you know you don't have genius that's actually separated from the reproductive scheme. And so is is that genetically fit? How genetically fit is that if you don't have any kids yourself, but you produce things creatively? And how does that get back into the gene pool? Maybe you since your nieces well, and maybe nephews, through influence. Yes, exactly. So then you have this meta, this this mimetic idea of okay, we've got the level of the genes, and then we've got the level of the memes that's built on top. So people like Leonardo da Vinci, uh, and Michelangelo, who now I think we call gay, or people like Beethoven, who always fell in love with with very posh girls who he taught piano, and is not known to have had any children because they, he would always be palmed off as the, the piano tutor rather than getting to be like the, the get, get, getting to wed the the the, the countess you know um so you know these great people who've never had any kids yeah they have a lot of influence for centuries you know my my, my father always said I'm, I'm 33 now my father always said to me mozart didn't know he was going to die age 35 but he managed to do enough so that his name will never die until our civilization does. He didn't know he was doing it. He wasn't doing it with posterity in mind. Yeah. And he did, in the end, write a requiem days before he died, which he didn't even finish, which is very interesting. Um, but nevertheless, he, my father always said, like, look at your life on the Mozart clock. Like, how are you doing at posterity, accidental posterity, because he wasn't planning it. Or like one and half of the source of, one and a half of Burning half. Man. Yes. The Suicide Club. Oh, okay. Every day like it's your last. 
Mm. Because hey, it may well be. Um, just yeah, no, moment. exactly. No. Um, so, yeah, I sent you that Sphinx last night for that reason. I haven't um, seen the Sphinx. Oh. Uh, yeah, it took us to, I ended up taking the route down by, down by the river and stopped by the, the, the Egyptian needle and we found this astonishing Sphinx okay. at dawn. Oh, um, it's on there. Uh, so should we get back to the uh, the long tail and uh, and quantum? Yes. Human quantum. Yes, human quantum. And maybe human blockchain. Yes. Because I, I, I haven't gone into the uh, the consolidated presentation that um, is being produced by my much smarter, much more experienced um, uh, partners. In yes. The, uh... <laughs> so um, where should we where should we begin? Because most of my stuff comes out like gibberish. So um, yeah, I mean it's. So, so human, you had a go at reading it yesterday. Like, I had, I had very, a little look at that, that, that uh, worked example section. Mm. Should we just play the video? Let's play yeah, the go video. On, go on, do it. Yeah, go on. Um, I think it's a great video. So, uh, what, how, what's uh, it's like Boogaloo something? What was it? Um, uh, uh, Gumball 3000. You got the Gumball right? I didn't, no, but I've done two uh, charity cannonballs. Gumball 3000. And I've, and I've, and I've run a couple of my own. So, with one of them, I built. Called five or six of my subcontractors and built eight orphanages for sexually abused kids in the in the Philippines. Oh, and then I got to be a total fucking selfish, arrogant twat for a week and not. I didn't need to feel bad about it. Yeah, I think yes. that's a net no, calming sheep yes. game. Yes, yeah. um, no one died, and uh, I had a fucking brilliant time. So no. if you, if you share the screen, Ollie, then we can. <laughs> but I was writing this. I'd just example. gone into this OCD um, bunker. Yes. Um, and about quantum, you know, which is effectively the human quantum version. I think is social media with the long tail. Mm. You know, everyone being connected with everyone. So the more the, or less the proof of attention. The, the, yeah. the seven degrees of separation is down to probably two now, and instead of having to write a book having studied forever yeah. and practiced to become an expert and then maybe someone might find the book yeah, you're right. might read it is he being retarded a little bit okay um, um, no can you help him um no i told him i haven't got any coming. money at the moment and he's going to be very generous and give me some money lend it to me well i mean he's coming here um but he doesn't know where it is he's like, <laughs> he's in green park and he's like how far is it like, no, 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 no. just tell him to get a fucking uber and just, 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 just send him just send him this um um yeah so 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 so, so, so the the combine link so. the long tail principles mathematics marketing social media with the quite unique situation that we find ourselves in at the moment which is the whole world basically been what 80 percent shut off to typical capitalist yeah, economics, um, capitalism having been suspended for a period of time. Yeah, we've had a we've had a we've had a, a test run. Yeah. We've had like a proof of concept in the West on bourgeois office workers of the universal basic income concept, which Andrew Yang ran on for many in the not primary. Everyone. Yeah, Andrew, I couldn't get any. <laughs> Andrew Yang ran it on it in the in the primary in in the Democratic primary earlier this year. Single tick, single issue ticket of universal basic income. His idea was okay. We have the we have the Kissinger Mao deal that takes all the, that for the past fifty years has created the geopolitical economic reality of taking all the industry out of the West and China and then socializing the profit into the communi Chinese Communist Party and the banking elite and they can take off the profit together create their breakaway civilization let the let the chinese social credit system then come back into america with with the smartphones and with the inversion of blockchain tech into this command and control system this 1984 uh surveillance system which we're seeing deployed now and so you know, you take this you take this and then andrew yang turns up in the democratic party, the nice little tech guy who says well, you know, we're going to automate an AI and mechanize out all of these, all of the factory workers that are left in the West, you know, and so we now need to give them, so, uh, as a socialist principle, we need to give them universal basic income. Or and give them universal basic income and a guitar. Exactly. Well, they're meant great to time. buy a guitar. So what, what I happened? don't think automation is such a bad thing. I think people are going to find more what? fun things to do when they don't need to. Exactly. What <laughs> happened when well, Andrew I mean, Yang dropped you know out? What? At the end of the day, that's what Mark says. He's like, at some point, People are going to need to work four hours a day because we're going to yes. be so productive. Or they'll be spending 
18 hours a day talking about themselves and all that kind of, you know, so this is, therapeutic this is, things that they've been subjected to and can now pass on, like in the case of the Cardassians. So Andrew Yang drops And they'll play out. the guitar a little bit. A Andrew Yang drops And hopefully out. we all benefit. Or and then a month or so later, we have the cockdown and we have this, this teat of, of quantitatively eased money based on the new gold standard from the Bank of England because they've got, they've got their political committee that then can say Venezuela's gold. Oh, no, that's Britain's gold. It's fine because Venezuela's got an illegitimate <laughs> government and we'll just take possession, eminent domain, the gold that's in the Bank of England vault for them to trade in the city. Sorry, so, they've just, so in the changeover, uh, uh, in the changeover between Carney and the new guy at Bank of England, they had they set up the political committee and now they've managed to take back all the money, all the gold that Gordon Brown sold at the low price Have because they? it's all been in the same what, room at a higher price. Yeah, so it's all been in the, higher it's price. all been in the room all along. All they need to do is eminent domain it back. They need to find a contract issue where they say, oh, this owner is forfeiture. Um, and so they've started it with with, with I think you're OCDing it. Um, anyway, <laughs> so so we then had we then had a middle class, unlike the Andrew Yang version of the of the the working class having to get the universal basic income instead we had the middle class get it with this cop down and so they all went home and they were either hot desking like remote desktop or like not working at all and as dan says what 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 mark said would happen if we all work two hours a day on the sewage treatment plant on the farm and we make it really efficient we just do a little bit of labor we have 22 hours a day each to become you know poets philosophers composers musicians you know uh, uh, and producing beautiful startup companies and at self actualized the, at the top of the at the top are of we, the uh, maslow hierarchy already but so the thing is the thing is what happened in the proof of concept it's, it's like for everyone Like, like I'm, not, I'm not sure I've met what a person in, in life in, who isn't in the West quietly a poet. A, uh, of course, yeah, but like and a, and you, can't, a, and a, you can't just do it full time because no, 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 no. Of course, yeah. just partially. Yeah, yeah. but the idea um, is that you but, know, but you most can, most of them won't share that because they're too sensitive <laughs> about it and they think they're going to be humiliated, stigmatized, yes, well, I mean, like, judged by it. He doesn't talk so much about like. Like a, the human experience. Oh no, I don't, but I don't mean Marx's overall yeah. view. I mean, I mean the people that yeah, I've met in real life. Exactly, and they would want to. They would want to do that more, rather than or be more open about what they do anyway. But if you if you look at what they did, a few this, people share more lockdown. things with me because but I'm so in the blunt main, and deleted it, all my filters. Like, in the main, yeah. people were on TikTok like creating little dance videos, which in TikTok is a Chinese company, which is reverse engineered this hypnosis system of Snapchat, which is a, which is a pedo system. <laughs> um, uh, you know, Snapchat is a pedo uh, app to ch funnel self authored child porn into the hands of Epstein's and so on. And then the so Chinese went on. Bothered to set up a Snapchat and, then, yeah, and then the Chinese <laughs> took this to the next level where they just hypnotize people into the matrix and they get to do little dances on TikTok. Okay. Can I, um, can I humiliate my friend now who's being retarded? Okay, go on. And then we'll watch the video. What is this video that has been requested? It is a, a okay. worked example. Manny, where are you? It's a worked example of his quantum idea of human Sorry, originality. you're where? Um, so human you're still at Green Park yeah, Station. Like, so, have so you not considered what the idea looking is that at the unconscious address competence that I have to be in the flow state? WhatsApp? And once you're in that flow state, you can produce Man. more iterations okay. of if ideas, you, If you organize a taxi... Of, or an um, Uber or a Bolt, and you give them the address that I sent you about. <laughs> um, so okay. yeah, if you if you're, 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 if you you're live, that by the way, state. on the internet, stroke TV right now, being retarded. Okay. <laughs> so thank you so much for bringing mon me money to survive. Um, but can you please stop being quite so fucking retarded? And hurry up. Cheers, mate. Bye. Love you. Bye. It's amazing how close and calm you are. So, um, human quantum. So, the idea is, as far as I got it from what you were saying in this video, uh, was that in a flow state, in that unconscious competence which we spoke about, um, you you can then iterate. You can produ you can produce originality, and you can produce reactions to stimuli really quickly because, as you say, time slows down, and you get you get into the moment. And so, giving people the opportunity to do that is then an example. Here's a worked example of it. I think that was where we were starting from. Okay. Well, my my my. I mean, maybe that's exactly it. But my 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 suggestion is, no one, in my opinion, can judge anyone else completely because we haven't 
walked their entire life in their shoes. We can't possibly imagine the experiences they've had and therefore why their gut might tell them and the compound benefit of all that experience, what they should be doing next mm. if they're going to be efficient and as quick as possible in responding to situations. Mm. I like to follow my gut, but I try and, where I can, um, differentiate between impulse as well. Because Plato thought most of your thinking went on your gut and the brain was just like... And the brain's too slow. The, 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 brain's the conscious slow. brain is too slow. The automatic is much faster and that tends to come system from the gut. System 2, General Kahneman. That sounds mm. very smart, but I haven't read that yet. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I, I saw the blurb on a book once. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Here we go. Here we go. Um, yeah, so my, but, but if you, if you, oh, I bought that book three times and I've never read it. <laughs> so annoying. I you were thinking too fast. <laughs> so my understanding of quantum is that you basically just run every scenario at once. Now, the closest I can imagine relating to that in human terms is with social media we've gone from seven degrees of separation to one or two mm. now we've just demonstrated this tonight actually so we tweeted out to guido Fawkes and his gang who oliver very cleverly found was looking for a live stream facility uh, to do a new news channel uh, and, and get into the get into the live stream game, and so we we tweeted them earlier, we twatted them earlier uh, <laughs> to say, look, look, watch now and see. This is a thing that does exist. It's quite easy. It's already here. Mm. Um, so we've got that. We, we we've got that idea of yes, okay. You run I all. Think of I've the, had a you, little exchange with him in the past, maybe oh, yeah. a few years ago, or them. So you run all um, of the scenarios, the quantum. Yeah. So in, 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 in social media, is the principle of the the. Well, I'm picking out the long tail mm. because the old eighty twenty principle. You get eighty percent of the benefit. Yeah focusing on 20% of the customers or whatever. Um, well, there is actually extraordinary value in the long tail if other people aren't competing to reach them. Mm. And there are you're connected to enough people for that to build up a significant enough audience and potentially to build up over time. You know, mm. To be in the newspapers, it has to be significant enough and mm. high-profile enough quickly enough mm. to attract enough readers but with the long tail principle social mm. media you can build up you can build a movement over time yeah and that's something what we're doing that might here. not have attracted enough people initially yes can, can snowball. over time snowball yeah. and it can adapt and integrate all of their ideas too yes. or some of them the best ones yes. hence think tank yes. yeah um, um so oh. so um right, phil you're live on tv right now so um Please don't repeat yourself too much. And you have the address, so maybe not. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so <laughs> my, um, my, my, my thinking is, mm. with OCD and ADHD being bred at the top and the bottle, bottom and Germany at <laughs> the top of the bottle, um, <laughs> Germany being the squeezed middle as the illustration, mm. sub 2.0 replacement birth rate, somewhat disinterested, aging and declining, um, we're going to have to figure this stuff out. The mental illness or mental disorder oh, or Christabel simply specialization oh, component. Um, and I, I, I kind of think that ADHD defends the OCD yes. sometimes as well. Um, um, so, so I, I, the I think but the problem Germany. is, the problem is if you have the level of prejudice, judgment, um, stigma and absolutism yeah I, I try and check myself whenever i say whenever <laughs> yeah or all yes, you were saying so all maybe i'm missing yeah. something because that's a throwaway comment that means i probably haven't thought about it at all um, i like to follow my gut but i try and avoid the impulsive so, so so i was thinking about bread at the top and the bottom uh the ocd adhd and i don't know if you're familiar with the another nice another nice sort of uh Journalist worthy book paradigm, like like uh, Gladwelly book paradigm, is R and K selection. Have you come across R and K selection? They're really it's a really interesting. It's another spectrum. Okay. So R selection is the equivalent of uh, it, it, you can, you can like place different elements on this spectrum. So R selection and you can move. Yeah, the spectrum move. as well because so, your body and your brain. An example, itself an example of R. Hey, Christabel, oh, yeah. how are you? Uh, you remember Martin uh, coming 
I'm in. I'm in. Um, Did I do so, something really bad last no, time? Sure. So R and K. No, no, come, come in. No, here. come in. Come in. Come, come in. in. Take, take the, take the, take well, the. Well, you're extremely uh, welcome to come in. Please, please, you can't. You're not here. Okay, you're not okay, here. Okay. She's not here. Well, is the PR? She's not here. Um. Anyway, you're, you're kind of here. so R and K selection. So, yeah. Some booze. Yeah. Uh, there's cold ones in the fridge. Well, there's. Um, okay. um with Coca-Cola. Diet. Oh yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. So, um, oh, so R K selection. R selection in human terms is something like the Goths, Vandals, Visigoths, and oh, K Goths. selection is something like the Romans. So the idea is that the 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 Goths, Vandals, and Visigoths sacked Rome because the Romans got too weak. Um, as Alex Jones said the other day, even the strongest of us are weak now. Um, because so because of this. Because of this lack of, of, of fortitude on the part of the Romans, all their libraries, all their civilization, all their network of engineering, and 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 what have the Romans ever done for us? Stuff was undermined by decadence. Was undermined by not doing enough case selection. So case selection is having few children and putting huge amounts of investment, super investment, into those kids so that they survive, and they and and they have a long education. So humans are case selected by comparison to almost all animals. Think about horses or giraffes. They can walk. They can walk when yeah. <laughs> they can walk when they get out of the womb, right? They they plop out of the womb and they can already run because they've got to run from predators like Bambi. Um, so so you're not here though. No, unless you sit and you've got to shut up. I like being the disembodied boy. <laughs> Got my uh, <laughs> um, so now Why you just sit give us uh, camera three. No. Give us camera three, I Ollie. Really, I don't think um, <laughs> Mrs. X. Okay. Be... Actually, it's probably best that she doesn't. Yeah. Because I'm not in good shape today. Um, okay. So our case selection. So humans are case selected in our in spoiling. ourselves. We just we, well, on a relative we're basis. I'm not looking good. Um, you're beautiful. You know you're beautiful. Well, you're, 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 what you said to my mum. <laughs> uh, so um our social case selection so you can see it within humans and non-human animals right so yeah. horses and deer are very r selected they have loads of kids and they see them about fish even more so think about cod row and like caviar they like they like they they splurt they splurge their eggs into the sea and see if they like hatch or, or frogs they just shove the frog spawn Most you, of mine you goes see into these, these are all r selected <laughs> as sock um, under under that bed in, in, in um, uh, these are all these are all these are all our selected traits, right? Having loads of kids and and letting them run riot and then seeing if they survive without investing in them. So the op so the opposite of that is, is Bill Gates's plan is elephants, is dolphins, is humans. It on the animal spectrum. Also, ants are quite case selected because although they have loads of kids, they have like the structure and hierarchy. Bees too. They're, they're trying to preserve as as alpha, beta, and gamma. Yes, with a book about um, the... stock trading stuff. And... Oh yes. So um, apparently, so, I'm alpha. So our case, but our case selection then goes within humans In as terms well. Of, like doing stuff. And so you, so not... you then look at you know people with few, as you were saying, the squeeze middle of Germans with less than two percent replacement rate. So they're highly case selected. Like they're very organised. They're very beta male. They all they all subsume themselves into anything the collective. that functions in the home unless it's German. And um and so well, they why, why does it have to be German? Just so reliable. They just do it properly. And they 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 do the parts. You know they they still for nineteen twenties Mercedes they still do the parts. It's still going. You know um, and like a million miles is standard for a, a Mercedes taxi. So um uh, they're, just, they're just brilliant engineers. So yeah, R and K selection. So Germany is highly and golfers. Highly K selected. I don't like golf, but, but the problem does. with it is it's not original enough, right? <laughs> and so you need the combination of K selection of like libraries, education, high investment in kids, but also the creativity of the spark, and that can either come from inside or from outside. Then the R selection is like hordes of hordes of very low investment kids, whether it's whether it's foals or fish or humans. Um, and, and then that that kind of that model says, okay, we 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 scatter shot and then hopefully we'll get some unicorns. Um, and they'll take over and they'll they'll destroy Rome and they'll turn the books into in Hi Phil, you're 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 files. you're live on TV again. No, you're on you're on you're on TV. You're on TV now. Uh, if you go to uh, the new Athens, the new Athens, on the new Athens online, on YouTube, you'll see yourself. Well, we're we're in an underground bunker, so we're not allowed to really tell anyone where we are. Yeah, it's good. Um, but I've already sent you the address. I've sent you the address. 
I've sent you the address on WhatsApp. Still at the same address that I sent you before. Yeah. Would you like the same address again? Same address. Yeah. I just yeah yeah, yeah. To same you. address. I'll put, I'll, tell you, I'll put you on speakerphone because then then your repetition will be obvious. Yeah, well, why don't you go to WhatsApp? Because if, yeah, I've sent you the address. Okay, how much cash you have for me, man? How much cash you have for me? I don't have any money until Manny arrives, but Manny is coming, but he's also slightly so genius, retarded now, like you. Now. He's coming. You don't have any money now. I will have lots of money for you if you just money come along. What? Drugs. I mean, uh, sorry, for champagne. Champagne. Which champagne. Is Champagne. All right, listen, I've got the money coming. I'm going to send you Manny's details and you can talk to each other. He's bringing champagne. Don't get LP. Just get the expensive stuff. No, I haven't got that much money coming. I haven't got that much money coming. Get the cheap stuff. Bring me the cheap stuff. Come and have fun on TV. Barman, and pour Manny me a drink will bring the money. Barman, pour me a drink. You're too busy. Where are you? You said you were five minutes away. I have lots of money coming. Manny is en route from Green Park. He's just similarly repetitive. Oh, fuck it. I'll give you my spare phone. I don't care anymore. You can have the sunglasses as well, and you can have some of the vodka. <laughs> I'm on TV right now, mate. I'm already downstairs. <laughs> I'm already downstairs. Yes. See you in five minutes but you know where we're going, yeah? You're going to NW1. What is NW1? Are you serious? I sent you the address. Now it's Manny. Look, Manny is also <laughs> lost. Now I have to answer Manny. You haven't, it's fine. NW, look in your fucking WhatsApp. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're, you're, you're on TV as well. Now. Where, are you lost in Green you know, Park still? Example, people. Here we go. Two tracks. Two tracks. <laughs> yes, Manny, you're on TV. I can't wait for you to repeat yourself as well. <laughs> I'm downstairs. This is inside. accelerated thinking. Versus, uh, Why don't you follow the, the address? Again. Okay, I'm going to pass you over to someone who's slightly less retarded than you. <laughs> Can someone please deal with money? Because yeah, Manny's got the money. <laughs> so, um, we had a work design. I have one to work to punch both of them in the head if they thinking. repeat themselves. Yeah, no, that's the it's pointless. Time, like, it's like how, much, how many times do you need to see an address yeah. to get it right? Okay, if you're using Shitty Mapper, Shitty Mapper is very shitty. Google Maps all the way. And it way. does I'm take Google you, Maps when you way. put in Mornington Media here, you get Mornington Crescent. Okay, can we finish the bit? So, about, yeah, okay. Um, uh, where were we? Processing. So quantum... Human quantum processing. <laughs> yes. So, um, Christopher, Before if, the you, press, arrives if the money. you press four, if you press camera four, there we go. Okay, so can I leave you, you while I sort out my two retards, please? This okay, so, is, um... so we're, you we're, play this. we're just playing this, and we'll, we'll, we'll if you turn, Christopher, so we'll give us a picture in picture. <laughs> now we know how to do that. Great. Can we oh, hear this? We need to do the sound thing. So we, we, we're now seeing uh, Martin's worked example of flow state and the quantum and the human quantum at work in a story. Here we go. At one point in, I think, at the beginning of Arizona, coming close to Navajo Nation, the cops got behind us and turned on the sirens. The pilot turns around and says, I'm going to go for it. And it was a moment in the car where I can't do anything, but I knew that I was along for the ride. He sped up to about, probably about 150 and lost that cop. But in the exchange of going 150, blew past another cop that was just poking along at about 90 and undercover. It's bad. Sirens in the back. He turned on his cherries and he started the chase. I tell this guy, there's another town coming up in about maybe 12 miles. No sooner do we say that we get to the top of this hill and we see a full roadblock over the next hill. So we've got one more valley and one more rise and we got him from both sides. At that moment, a dirt road opens up on the side into the Navajo reservation. Now we're in a Viper off-roading at about freaking 80 miles an hour. I mean, you know, you never heard an undercarriage get more beat up. We come off the main Navajo road onto a side dirt road. That's for like four by fours. And there's like a Navajo hut 
and there's an Indian standing out there. I'm so, I'm so confused. We think this guy speaks Spanish. So he starts screaming, La Policia, La Policia. The guy's like, what? Like the fucking police are following me. <laughs> I'll take care of you. Just don't let them know we're here. Which way should we go? He points us. We head down this crazy road about six more miles. We get to the end of the road. It ends at a canyon, a Grand Canyon, like a mini canyon. I mean, like a thousand foot drop. Where do you go? Well, we take it into the trees. Then we start driving the Viper through the trees, like maybe a half a mile through trees and branches. We get it hidden, pull out all the gear, make a run for it. At this point, I'm a victim. I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I'm scared. I'm temporarily insane. So we make a run for it, dive under the bushes and hide there. I would say we probably stayed in those bushes for about eight hours until the sun started to fall. It was about 12. It was about eight by then. Come back to the car. He peels off all the stickers, takes off the orange band. Then the, then the Navajos come and look for us in the pickup truck. They come up. They want their money. They get paid their money. In exchange, they get extra money to go out 30 miles in all directions, make sure there's no more cops. They go out in all directions, come back with the pilot. We get in the car. We've got 40 miles left in the tank. We end up coasting on fumes into the first gas station, fill up, and head off to Vegas about 11 hours behind everyone else. Insane. Apparently, the fine would have been a year in prison. That's what I heard. It was wild. It was wild. At one point, in I think at the beginning of Arizona, coming close to Navajo Nation, the cops got behind us and turned on the sirens. The pilot turns around and says, I'm going to go for it. And it was a moment in the car where I can't do anything, but I knew that I was along for the ride. He sped up to about probably about 150 and lost that cop. But in the exchange of going 150, blew past another cop that was just poking along at about 90 and undercover. The sirens in the back. He turned on his cherries and he started the chase. I tell this guy, there's another town coming up in about maybe 12 miles. No sooner do we say that, we get to the top of this hill and we see a full roadblock over the next hill. So we've got one more valley and one more rise and we got them from both sides. At that moment, a dirt road opens up on the side into the Navajo reservation. Now we're in a Viper off-roading at about freaking 80 miles an hour. I mean, you, know, you never heard an undercarriage get more beat up. We come off the main Navajo road onto a side dirt road that's for like four by fours and there's like a Navajo hut and there's an Indian standing out there. I'm so, I'm so confused. We think this guy speaks Spanish. So he starts screaming, La Policia, La Policia. The guy's like, what? Like the fucking police are following me. <laughs> I'll take care of you. Just don't let them know we're here. Which way should we go? He points us. We head down this crazy road about six more miles. We get to the end of the road. It ends at a canyon, a Grand Canyon, like a mini canyon. I mean, like a thousand foot drop. Where do you go? Well, we take it into the trees. Then we start driving the Viper through the trees, like maybe a half a mile through trees and branches. We get it hidden, pull out all the gear, make a run for it. At this point, I'm a victim. I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I'm scared. I'm temporarily insane. So we make a run for it, dive under the bushes and hide there. I would say we probably stayed in those bushes for about eight hours until the sun started to fall. It was about 12. It was about eight by then. Come back to the car. He peels off all the stickers, takes off the orange band. Then the, then the Navajos come and look for us in the pickup truck. They come up. They want their money. They get paid their money. In exchange, they get extra money to go out 30 miles in all directions, make sure there's no more cops. They go out in all directions, come back with the pilot. We get in the car.
Welcome back to Lorenzo. Dines with incels. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> <laughs> tell us about. Tell us about. Tavistock. I'm not actually on, am I? Tell us about Tavistock. You're on, you're on, you're on. Oh, fuck's sake. Why do you have. Christopher, you're when, you, you're when, you're when you were. You're on. <laughs> Their auditors can't find 1.9 billion euros worth. They don't know where it is. It might not be there. It might nev not have ever been there. It might have been stolen. Who knows, right? So this is the case if you look at the Fed's balance sheet, if you look at your government's balance sheet, if you look at any of the, uh, the corporate balance sheets of any company listed on any stock exchange, you're going to find the same thing. And we're going to look at uh, a, a staggering number of side hustles. Uh, everything is a hustle. Everything is a shakedown. Everything is like a Times Square 1970 sort of scam uh, because we have all this paper printing that has basically created the moral hazard and the incompetency and the inefficiency in our global system. Here is Matt Stoller looking at a chart that we covered last week from Deutsche Bank, U.S. rising share of companies with debt service and costs that are higher than profits. Such a fundamentally important chart. American corporations are increasingly doing business only as a side hustle to their real purpose, which is transferring cash from lenders to looters. Remember, the lenders are, you know, the, all, all those bonds that are being put onto the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. This is what is happening. It's being transferred to these zombie companies uh, and they're looting it. Well, you know, this goes back to something we've been saying for a number of years now that corporations only really have a profits in terms of what they can engineer on their cash desks, as they're called. Right. So you have uh, like a car companies in America, they stopped making money making cars. They made money leasing cars and then taking the income from those leases and building derivative portfolios and Ponzi schemes. And then the executives would buy back their own stock. And then the options would go up in value and they'd all become billionaires somehow magically, uh, not knowing why, even though their car companies were losing money and losing market share. Same thing with the banks, obviously. Now, every single corporation in America pretty much just doesn't do what it says it does. The food companies don't make food. The car companies don't make cars. The Computers don't make computers. They don't do what they say they're doing. All they're doing is they're gaming the system by getting the free cash from the Fed, if you're part of the privileged class, and then you know whipping that up to these huge paydays for the executives using, as was described here, that's just the latest chapter in the latest kind of revelation that you've got a transfer mechanism where the S&P 500 is just a front for like um, the money laundering, right? We've talked about money laundering in the past, like a restaurant that's ostensibly a restaurant, but it's actually a money laundering hub or face, right? So the entire American economy is just a facade for money laundering at this point. Well, it's a facade for money printing. So the fact is since 1971, nobody in America, not a single person, nobody has had to actually genuinely work. We just print money the Chinese, Asians, Europeans send us their goods for our printed money. There has been a facade of, of having to work. Well, the, the pandemic has put a lie to that. So we're all at home. Nobody's having to do anything. And they're starting to realize their uselessness, their lack of value in anything in the economy. And that is the paper uprising. That is the paper spring. Well, I guess we're in summer now. And we know we're in summer because we're almost as hot as the Sahara Desert. Not quite as hot as the Siberia, of course, because <laughs> that's in the Arctic and that's hotter. Right. You know, David Graeber wrote a book about all the nonsense jobs in the economy and that none of them are really necessary. And if people said, hmm, that's kind of interesting, you know, they didn't really take it on too seriously. But here the COVID-19 virus has proven that most jobs are completely superfluous and unnecessary to the economy. And they're just uh, there to keep people kind of sedated. There's nothing functionally or um, kind of constructively that they add to the economy in, in any way. Yes, we're transferring from lenders to looters. Ultimately, all the, uh, the debt from the lenders goes on to the Fed's balance sheet. So it goes on to the population's balance sheet, thus uh, removing any sort of potential for the future. Uh, I think a lot of this stuff is instinctively understood because we are still, you know, animals, primordial goop that we came out of and we understand, we have an, a survival instinct and we understand this. And I think this is what this paper uprising is about. And 
Another headline, a staggering number, over $18 trillion in global stimulus in 2020, 21% of world GDP. So Bank of America Chief Investment Officer Michael Hartnett concluded that there's just, there's just one bull market to short, and that is namely credit, i.e. the debt markets. He says they are a, a 500-year bubble, and it's a perfect one to short. However, the Fed will not allow you to do that, so don't fight the Fed. And therefore, we have this absence of truth. So this notion of, of people like fake news and, and this, this, this battle with the truth, like our history is a truth, is some of it is interpretation. What is it real? What is not real? What is truth? What is not truth? Why we're knocking down all these monuments? I think it's part of this paper uprising is that we have all this fluff and people still have genuine needs for food, shelter, you know, love, uh, community. And all of that is coming together because of this, the absence of price discovery over the, since 1971, the absence of any real value since 1971. I think this is the culmination of all of these. This is my interpretation. This is our conversation, our philosophical conversation about this though. All right. So this is the culmination. You think this is really 2020 is when all this stuff comes together. You know, you mentioned the fact that interest rates are very, very low and that the bond market in America is at a 240 year high and it's in a over a 300 year high in Great Britain. Our bonds have never been this high in America or Great Britain in hundreds of years. And actually, interest rates have not been this low going back to it's actually more than 3000 years. Uh, so this is truly an epic moment, an inflection point. If, if this, in fact, is the moment of comeuppance and it is the time at which this paper spring comes crumbling down, then the other side of this would be probably you'd have to compare it to Mount Vesuvius exploding or the tsunami disaster in Indonesia or um, other such great natural disasters. It, it, it could potentially be uh, a whirlwind of paper that uh, would have such magnitude and force and create such chaos throughout the global economy as to possibly eviscerate half the world's population. Well, it is a staggering number. 20.8% of global GDP has been injected in stimulus in just the past three months. So, you know, how we can get past that, I don't know, but I, th I think that the paper uprising that we're seeing is a rejection of it. And I think whatever happens next, and it might take two years, it might take five years, it might take 10 years for this to unravel. Right, the numbers are huge, right? So the global GDP is almost at a hundred trillion dollars. And the amount of money that they printed recently was 20 trillion, right? So 20% of global GDP, they they just blew into the economy with this fake fiat money, right? And that number is expanding almost exponentially. So we, as we've been saying on this show, going back to Davos a few years ago, they were preparing a credit facility with the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, of $100 trillion, right? So that sounds like we're about to enter uh, in an era when $100 trillion debt loads are the new norm. Uh, we already have a global debt, which is almost 300% debt to GDP of the globe. That's structured debt. That's just not money printing. So then you put the money printing on a similar track, and now it's 100 to 200 trillion in money printing. Even with interest rates at 0.0001%, the interest on all this money would be greater than the GDP of the United States or greater than the GDP of China. Right. So that's uh, this is a cataclysmic event uh, where we go through kind of the event horizon and um, everything becomes completely, uh, as we've mentioned before, we call this sp 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 a spaghettification of the global economy through the event horizon of quantum money printing. And the quantum money printing has led to this paper uprising, in my opinion. And part of it is because we've realized that we've all stayed home. Nothing is happening. Nothing is being produced. And yet everything is fine. Like the stock markets are at all time highs. Everybody's eating. They're getting the food stamps. They're getting their paychecks. And this it also exposes the paper Ponzi, the, paper, the, the illusion under which we have all been living since 1971. Just an incredible story in the Times. Poverty fell in April and May per one study because of the massive federal welfare expansion, including expanded unemployment, which was the extra $600 a week and $1,200 checks, even as the economy fell into a black hole. So as we see, everything around us has been closed down, shut down, no traffic, no air traffic, no nothing. Nothing's happening for three months. And yet 
poverty has declined because of this free money, all of this paper being sent to people like it's, I guess I should have used the money gun. They, these all kind of stick together. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they, they've sent all this free money and people realize, hey, wait, not only do I have that leisure time that's been promised by all these efficiency gains and advancements in AI and robots and technology, I'm sitting home. I got all this money. Let's uh, shop. <laughs> Right. It's amazing. People would say, you know, America's got 100, 120 million people at or below the poverty line. And other countries would say, oh, that's impossible. A third of the country or 40 percent of the country is poverty stricken. <laughs> and yet this is the proof that that data point is correct. That just a few hundred extra dollars a month. Suddenly average wage skyrocket. You know, it shows you that people living in their car, working two jobs uh, hand to mouth and on high fructose corn syrup, uh, it, it's not a healthy situation. And I want to say in the last few seconds here that, you know, just like the French Revolution was sparked after the people, the peasants realized they got to see the, the king's books. Right. That was a, 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 an attempt to quell the population. And they saw how the king lived. This, by sending them this $600 a week extra plus a $1,200 stimulus check, people are starting to see, wow, these are, this is why Jamie Dimon's a billionaire. This is why Lloyd Blank finds a billionaire. I could be a billionaire too. The Fed, plucky, can make me a billionaire. And he's chosen all this time not to make me a billionaire when all he has to do is throw me some money and I'm a billionaire. Why is it? Well, it was so easy this whole time. Plucky's never been so excited. Well, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, much more coming your way. Join me every Thursday on The Alex Salmon Show, and I'll be speaking to guests on the world of politics, sport, business, and show business. I'll see you then. Представьте вот такое же количество людей, только это количество деревьев, и они падают одновременно. Раз и упали. Это правда поражает, когда такое количество солдат здесь, в лесу, не дома, не с родными. Я был еще маленький, и мне матушка говорила, что есть такой у нас родственник Косипов Евгений Яковлевич, без вести пропавший вместе с лодкой. По правому борту кадеты торчит. Была похоронка, пропал без вести. Конечно, первое время мы ждали. We think he might be a Soviet soldier because of the boots he's wearing. Ты очень хочется, чтобы солдат все-таки был бы опознан, чтобы у него, может быть, был медальон, награда, еще что. Наверное, это самое важное, что есть поиски судьба солдата. My job is to do something bizarre, uh, if you think about it. I have to talk to you today about, really, the, the history of socialism, uh, where it's been and where it's going. Uh, and I'm reminded of a certain sad poem that Dylan Thomas used to recite as he traveled across the United States. He was going from one club to another, people interested in poetry, explaining, as he put it, the death of a movement inside poetry to a group of people who hadn't known it was born. And that was difficult for him. So I, I'm talking to you about socialism here in the United States, where we are now emerging rather like a hibernating bear from 50 years of repression in which socialism was neither taught, nor discussed, nor analyzed, nor appreciated, nor dealt with as if it were really there. It was swept under the rug if you were lucky, and it was demonized if you weren't, with demonization being the, the major form. 
Uh, and let me be real personal about it. Um, even though I come from humble backgrounds, for a lot of peculiar reasons, I went to the elite schools here in the United States. So my undergraduate time was spent at Harvard, and then I went to Stanford for my master's degree, and then I got my PhD at Yale. As you can see, I'm kind of a poster boy for elite education. And there I studied economics, history and economics. And in those three institutions, when I was going through them, I was never required to read one word of critical economic analysis, say by, I'll pick a minor author, Karl Marx, in order to understand, that was a joke by the way, just there, um, in order to understand the capitalist system that my teachers were pretending they were analyzing for me. That's an amazing statement. And it tells you something about what we are emerging slowly now from. It would be a dangerous miscalculation not to understand that 50 years of that repression, and that's what we've had, 50 to 60 years of it, uh, leaves deep scars, deep absences, deep vacuums. And as I go along in this conversation, you will probably notice them, but I don't want you to feel bad about it. It's not your fault. You live in a society that is only emerging from 50 years of taboo, and you can't possibly know what no one had the courage to teach you because it wasn't a decision based on economics or knowledge or science or anything else. It was a decision based on fear. Professors fearful for their careers, teachers fearful for their jobs, and everybody else fearful that something bad would befall them if they pursued an interest in criticism. So we have a tradition in economics, of which I'm a part too, of studying economics while reading the articles and the books of people who celebrated it at every turn. The very words in our discipline, optimality, we study Optimality, that's called the best of all possible worlds. We're optimal, we have equilibrium. Indeed, we have a lot of the things you search for in your own life, only you're probably smart enough to know you're not gonna find them. Economists think they found them, which is not to their credit. It's a problem. The metaphor I would use is the following. Suppose you had a family that lived up the street and you wanted to understand that family for whatever reason. And you knew there was mama and papa and two children. And you further knew that one of the children thought this was the greatest family the world had ever seen. Felt charmingly lovely and lucky about being born into it. And the other family thought, and the other child thought that this family was a psychological basket case. If you wanted to understand, I, I, I know nobody here has any experience of anything like this. Just think of other families that might be like that. If you wanted to understand such a family, would you talk to one child? Or would you think it was appropriate for you to talk to the child who loved the family, the child who was critical of the family, and then draw your conclusions based on the conversations you'd had? If you want to understand capitalism, friends, it's like understanding the family up the street. You can talk to the people who love it and celebrate it. Do that. That won't be hard because 99.9% .9 of the textbooks written are written by people who love it. But you need also to talk to the folks who are critical of it. Otherwise, you won't understand anything. A serious problem, and as I say, we're only emerging. So keep it in your mind as I go through what I have to uh, say to you. First, let me make the case that socialism is returning very quickly. Um, for the last 50 years, when socialism was a taboo, we were taught in the United States that the socialism has something to do with the Soviet Union and China. Those people are scary and frightening and want to hurt us. 
and so we should be angry and bitter at, at, at them. And one of the ways to express our anger, disagreement, and bitterness is to know as little as possible about the theory they claim to use to make sense of the world. Whatever logic you find in that, welcome to the United States for 50 years. Meanwhile, of course, socialism existed. The American people and the American media and the American government and the American academic community pretended that it wasn't there, but it always was, and it always has been. But for 50 years, you couldn't talk about it. Even the critical movements inside the United States, when they arose against nuclear testing, for peace, against racism, against sexism, and so on, were movements that were carefully cleansed of their Marxist or socialist or communist affiliations. Even when socialists and communists were leaders of them, they kept that fact quiet because it was scary for the others in those movements who wanted to be sure that whatever they were saying about those other social problems would not be compromised by being exposed as critics of capitalism. That really kept going until, I'm gonna exaggerate here, but just to make the point, until the autumn of 2011, when a new movement grew up, as they always do, this one took a peculiar name, Occupy Wall Street. It was even more peculiar because it was started by a group of relatively young people who thought it was terribly daring and provocative and revolutionary to set up pup tents in the park in downtown Manhattan. But it spread like wildfire. In three months, there were 350 cities across the United States who saw the same behavior. And what was very powerful was, instead of hiding their criticism of capitalism, the Occupy Wall Street movement did